Good afternoon and welcome to the sixth Global US Brain Trust Dialogue. Today's focus is brain health in the age of prevention. In our year-end Global Brain Trust Dialogue, we will review plans for the 2024 launch of a worldwide fingers initiative for women designed to shape globally innovative preventive strategies for women. Amidst global uncertainty, we can all find hope in scientific advancements related to Alzheimer prevention and brain health preservation. An AD vaccine would not just be a medical breakthrough, it could be transformative in the fight against Alzheimer's disease. However, successful development will require unprecedented collaboration and financial models mirroring successful ventures in other preventive medicine domains like statins and vaccines against infectious disease. The focus should not only be on the urgency of having such a vaccine, but also on redefining how we work together and finance dementia prevention, leveraging successful global pandemic response efforts. Now, with this uh, small introduction, I'd like to welcome my long-term collaborator, George Radenberg, founding chair of the Global CY Initiative on Alzheimer's Disease, the Davos Alzheimer Collaborative and a Covina of a Lausanne Dialogue. Um, we just had our Lausanne 10 Dialogue, and this platform really turns out to um, become a premier global forum for cross-sector information and collaboration, raising awareness about the need for a global ecosystem and transformative developments like Alzheimer's disease. George, thank you so much for joining. Let's just go into the discussion and explore how even in challenging times, the field of brain health offers a pathway to resilience, positive change and hope. Um, let me start by going back to Lausanne 10. Here, the, the topic, the prominent topic was Alzheimer prevention. And um, we discussed some of the important developments in the field. So what are for you the main takeaways which we can share with our audience? And what is the action plan which uh, we defined around this um, uh, key learnings? Well, I think there are two paths. Uh, well, first, Andrew, uh, thank you for inviting me to participate uh, in this important uh, uh, Global Brain Trust uh, Dialogue. Uh, there are two pathways to prevention, the two strategies. Uh, one is to find a therapeutic uh, intervention, a medicine or a vaccine uh, that will be able to be administered into populations at a time when they're cognitively healthy, uh, but which has the effect of stopping the progression of the disease, slowing it down, or preventing it. Uh, so uh, that uh, requires not only taking the current uh, initial crop of disease-modifying uh, therapies, but also introducing them uh, into populations uh, that are preclinical, that are cognitively normal. Uh, that is now going on. Both the Lilly and ASI have trials in that regard. Uh, but obviously, the premier and sort of uh, transformative and fixed star of how you would get uh, to uh, an ability to uh, stop this disease uh, before you ever get symptoms uh, is a vaccine uh, or an active immunotherapy. Uh, just a word about nomenclature here. There's a concern, I think, about using the word vaccine because it has so many different meanings in so many different contexts, and also because there is a certain vaccine a negativism in some certain parts of the world, and certainly a hesitancy uh, in parts of the world. So I think the in initial nomenclature that will be used here is active immunotherapies. Uh, it may mean functionally the same thing, but to a patient population that we don't want to confuse and whose trust we want to gain, I think we will use a more scientifically oriented term, active immunotherapy at the outset. And so that's one theory of how to prevent this disease. The other the thesis and strategy uh, is to intervene uh, early in the course, in midlife perhaps, or maybe even earlier, but at least in midlife, 
uh, to significantly reduce the prevalence of the risk factors uh, for, uh, uh, for late life dementia. Uh, that includes dealing with metabolic disorders, that is diabetes and heart and obesity, uh, but also changing our lifestyle factors so that we do not excessively drink or we don't smoke, uh, that we in fact uh, pay attention to our diet uh, and to exercise. And of course, one of your panelists this morning uh, or this afternoon uh, is uh, Mia Cavapelta, who's pioneered in this field and with whom we are proud to 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 to, uh, to 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 partner. And then there's the combination of the two. Uh, should we introduce lifestyle trials and interventions, uh, metabolic interventions at the same time, uh, so that in fact we begin to engage what will be important to engage in order to get widespread adoption of either of these strategies, and that is primary care, uh, because most places in the world don't have neurologists. They don't have high uh, high cost uh, PET scan screening techniques to detect this disease. So we're going to have to rely on primary care. Primary care, no, it does know how or can be trained up to understand cardiometabolic issues uh, and lifestyle recommendations. Uh, it will take us a long time uh, to get them uh, queued up to be able to administer vaccines. But that is the way we should be going. Vaccines uh, and this lifestyle uh, risk reduction strategy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely believe that it's really the combination. And this is one of the messages which we gave um, in these dialogues. Um, if you have risk factors in the family, um, if you have a diagnosis even uh, of Alzheimer, don't give up because there are already things you can do by changing the lifestyle. And since the beginning of the years, of course, we have now drugs. Uh, which can delay the cognitive um, delay. Um, in terms of concrete uh, action, uh, George, as you know, um, I always like the concrete actions. Um, how is the DAC now supporting programs that can diminish, reduce these risk factors by exactly these two uh, paths? On one hand, the pharmacological ones from new medicines, vaccines. On the other hand, the non-pharmacological one, um, for example, lifestyle changes where Mia will certainly give us an update. So what, how is DAC supporting it? Because I know DAC is supporting, for example, the FINGER initiative. Well, let's talk about the FINGER initiative initially. We are partnered with them now. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the view is, uh, as they are working now in 61 countries around the world, uh, and we're working in about 30, uh, that we should combine our efforts uh, to get primary care physicians, primary care, uh, facing uh, elements uh, of a health system in any country, uh, attuned to the fact that they can, uh, by the use of cardi cardiometabolic interventions and lifestyle factors, actually change the course or at least the risk uh, of this disease in significant ways. And the public health uh, uh, research uh, is showing us that we can perhaps reduce the prevalence of Alzheimer's through time up to 40 or 50 percent. Uh, so that is one major way to do that. But you have to uh, make the intervention inexpensive. You have to make it available through primary care outlets. Uh, and so that's exceedingly important. On the vaccine front, we have formed uh, a working group on vaccines uh, because it entails not just the eight companies that currently have either preclinical or clinical programs in this area, uh, but also regulators uh, from uh, major regulatory agencies, major countries, around the world, UK, EMA, uh, the United States, Japan, uh, and probably in the future, some regulatory agencies from uh, uh, large middle income countries, uh, but, uh, but also um, uh, payers. So we have companies, uh, payers, regulators, and of course, my organization basically is patient centric. So it's uh, all of the key elements that we need. There are some key regulatory issues. How do you approve an intervention in healthy people uh, 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 in the way of a vaccine? Uh, and the answer to that question is we've got to make sure that we know the science and the science is clear uh, that intervening uh, with an active immunotherapy uh, in, in healthy populations uh, is actually going to work. And importantly, if you're going to administer this vaccine to hundreds of millions of people potentially around the world at risk for the disease, uh, is it safe? Uh, and so regulatory issues are critical. Uh, and the regulatory agencies, I don't think yet, 
are persuaded of the science, but they're open to listening to the science on, uh, and they're open to figuring out how to approve uh, a, a vaccine. And payers, payers are concerned that in fact, they pay the cost of getting everyone screened for the potential risk of the disease. Uh, and then people get on a vaccine. Will they stay on the vaccine uh, for the period of time, potentially uh, lifelong, uh, with updated vaccines periodically, maybe annually, eventually? Uh, will they stay on vaccine uh, to be able to actually achieve the cost savings that would be associated uh, with the use of a vaccine rather than some of these higher priced uh, 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 disease modifying therapies that are currently being approved? So there are regulatory issues. There are payer issues, and of course, health systems. If you go to a World Health Summit, all they talk about is infectious disease and vaccines. We need to get that conversation, as you noted at the outset, shifted to vaccines in cancer and in Alzheimer's uh, and in other uh, chronic diseases of, of aging. Yeah, I think um, you really hit the nail. Um, um, I think one of the uh, key aspects in my view is that um, the, we still have to enhance the awareness uh, of people that um, the earlier you actually intervene with obviously an efficacious and safe product such a vaccine, the more successful the um, onset of a disease can be prevented. And this really uh, brings me to my last question to you. How can we actually effectively shift this treatment paradigm to disease prevention? How can we enhance your awareness? Number one, we are products in development and we're actually in late stage development and an early diagnosis with five to 10 years recognizing the disease before onset is actually possible. So how, what do we need to do before the first launch of such a vaccine, which uh, can happen in 2028, 2029? So what no, in, happen? in the United States, uh, we did some political polling in connection with our efforts to persuade Medicare to cover these initial rounds of drugs. And we found that half of the likely voters in 2024, uh, that is 85 million people, half of those, uh, half of the 170 million voters, 85 million, have this in their family or uh, with a friend. So the American people, and I presume this is uh, consistent around the world, Know this disease up close and personal. They know it. Some people want to know whether they have the disease or not, and will go to their doctor and, and, and ask. But many people say, why should I ask if they can't do anything about it? Mm -hmm. uh, and so what this uh, initial round of approvals by the FDA and Medicare in the United States means uh, is that people say, well, maybe there is something I can do about it. Uh, so I do think that that's opening up awareness, uh, but I think we need to reduce the costs uh, and the ease uh, with which uh, you can get a, a, a detection of a cognitive impairment uh, and, uh, and, and, and a diagnosis. Uh, and so that entails several things. We have the right tools. Blood-based biomarkers are coming. Uh, digital cognitive assessments are on the verge of being here in the next year or two. I think those uh, particular tests, which are much more accessible than PET scans, much more accessible than what we have today, and don't necessarily require a neurologist. I think that's going to make it easier for people to find out whether they are, are at risk of uh, the disease or have the disease. Uh, then we have to be able to say, we've got something for you to do. And that's where Mia's work is so important, because in fact, there are things you can do today, as you mentioned just a minute ago. Uh, so making aware uh, uh, making people aware there are things you can do today. How are they going to learn that? They're going to learn that through direct consumer, direct to consumer uh, techniques that are also going to work through their doctors, uh, through their healthcare professionals, through their obstetricians, through their gynecologists, uh, through pharmacies. So there are a variety of tools by which we can make them aware of the lifestyle changes that they should adopt now. And in fact, that in fact, they should be paying a lot of attention to, to diabetes, obesity, uh, and hypertension, and thus taking uh, hypertens anti-hypertensive drugs and these new GLP-1s, which are effective uh, against obesity uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and diabetes. So I think there are things now between the new GLP-1, the new anti-diabetic and uh, anti-obesity medicines uh, through uh, the d disease modifying drugs now being approved and through Mia's work uh, in terms of lifestyle changes uh, that we ought to be able to uh, get to the American people. And then doctors 
I have to learn this too. It's not exactly as if the doctors are really ready and primed to advise people about all of these potential things that they can do. We need to educate the health system. Uh, okay. uh, as well. Thank you so much, George. Um, we will come back to quite a few of the points you mentioned. Payers is one of them. But now it's my real pleasure to welcome um, our next speaker, um, which is Sans Takur. Sans is the chairwoman of the Tower Capital, serves on World Economic Forum councils, and has dedicated her career to shaping and leading initiatives related to generational investment and women health. And how well does that match our interest? Thank you, Asans, for being here. Um, I would like to bring George also in this discussion, but the first question actually goes to you. Um, I was very impressed yesterday when we discussed what your uh, initiative, uh, your fund is doing. Um, and maybe you can just summarize uh, very briefly what Tower Capital actually um, has in mind when it comes to women's health and um, uh, generational uh, health. And of course, what interests me in particular, how your experience, how your interests could potentially also overlap with what we want to do. We want to enhance women's brain health because this is the the, the, the aspect um, which is uh, affecting 70% of the women. And so I'm sure there are points where potentially we, we can do things together. But first, please speak about your excellent initiative. Thank you, uh, Andrea. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we at Tower Capital uh, believe in economic development, and we believe that there is no uh, generational health without women's health. So generational health is genetics, epigenetics, and environmental impacts that transcend generations, uh, first, second, third, to fourth, to fifth. And primarily, women are the carriers of this change. They're the transformation agents, as we like to say, um, in change and in long-term healthcare. What we do in Tower Capital is look beyond the labels of women's health and disease, and we evaluate and understand what are the critical innovations that must be supported, funded, and researched that enable the um, support of women's health longitudinally, community health, and reduce environmental toxicities that will challenge the shape of our evolutionary curves. And we do this in three ways because we believe all funding vectors are critical for this impact. The first is via economic development, as I mentioned, which is the corporates, the privates, and uh, some government uh, support with regards to funding. The second is via the nonprofit vehicle, which is leveraging charitable donations, works with governments and other large, en large endowments. And the third is via the fund vehicle so that we can encapsulate and garner the investment support of large investors and large communities of investors towards this purpose. We don't believe brain health stands alone. We do believe it stands inside of us as communities and women, and we are empowered to change that together. Um, thank you. As I said, uh, highly interesting. Um, but obviously, when you think about Alzheimer and how it is sort of located in families over generations, we don't even understand exactly to date, it's not genetic, it's some, some other aspects. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, one important aspect of this generational health, and for that matter, women's health, uh, would be, in fact, to look or prevent, we, we uh, preserve the brain health. So how well is this um, represented in, in the Tower Capital initiatives? I have to push you a little very bit. Very important question and a very, actually a very critical one to even understanding the scope 
of mm -hmm. generational health. Generational health is not just defined by what's in our genes, of course. Uh, it vectors environment. As we know, even and the NIH has reported, in infancy, genes account for less than 25% of variation in cognition, whereas the family environment accounts for approximately 60%. So in addressing early access to care, uh, to the most important and underserved communities, addressing this inequity means funding it at a community level and at a maternal level in a way that may have significant longer term impacts to cognitive health than we ever can understand. Inequity at birth is a generational problem and health access and financial access is a longitudinal one, which unfortunately is highly un inequitable and long-standing. So as part of our strategy in our investment thesis, we identify, fund, and research at the preventative and early stages, those innovations and those investments are that are going to address both the familiar, the caregiver support, and access requirements necessary for mental health, the biological health, as well as brain health. Um, George, let me come back to um, our common concern right now. So actually the science is now progressing. We have the first two approved products. Um, we have vaccine vaccines, which are safe and uh, potentially efficacious. So how do we deal with the payers and the financial sectors to bring them back to invest in fact in the prevention aspect of Alzheimer's? How do we how do we bring this back on the table? How do we work with them? Well, um, the payers actually have invited themselves now to our work group on on vaccines because they are going to ask themselves the same question. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, there are a variety of sources of capital in this space. In COVID, we learn that capital can come from governments, capital can come from business, capital can come from investors like Tower Capital and others, and public investors uh, in pharma, uh, and capital can come from payers who pay for the medicine. So uh, there are a lot of sources of capital. They all have to work together. A phase three trial in an active immunotherapy is going to be $500 million or more. Uh, wow. That is not something that a venture capitalist is likely to do on their own, uh, but mostly likely to team cap it, team um, tackle, uh, but team tackle maybe with government, maybe team tackle with pharma, uh, but in a way that in fact investors can make money, but it's a high risk venture. Uh, and then of course, uh, payers may pay for the vaccine, uh, but there are a lot of costs uh, that have to be borne by industry or by private sector players or by philanthropists, as, as Sanz has said, uh, at big time. So I think this is going to take a combination of capital sources uh, from government, large foundations, uh, and investors, uh, as well as pharma. Sanz, we want maybe to add something to George, what George said. I, I agree with George. It's a multi-vector strategy. It has to be one that enables both short-term high-risk investment as well as long-term more stabilized investment. Uh, one of the things that we are currently um, ideating around is a, a, a broader cooperative uh, that can invest in highest unmet need categories such as this, which essentially can remove a little bit of risk over time and remove optionality to participate. So we have to look at multi-vector and more creative models of funding uh, that can overcome some of the short-term and short-sighted interests of some of our stakeholders. Yeah, um, I think um, this will be the discussion certainly we would need to have um, over the next months and even years, but uh, we don't have so much time. Um, and I'm almost uh, speaking uh, George's language. Um, we, how do we get this vaccine to the global, to a world by 28, 29? Can we take any of the learnings of the COVID-19 initiatives where everybody was forced almost to work together. Um, it was an um, infectious disease. It was uh, threatening the world, but actually Alzheimer uh, in terms of mortality is almost bigger. Uh, so what, what, what can we do? How can we put this pressure on governments to actually uh, 
believe and act on the uh, need to move the timelines and work together and not just uh, tomorrow but immediately today so what needs to happen to to uh, get this pressure on everyone to change what we have today so you want to go first you go first this time Sure, yeah. certainly. So I will pull also from my previous, previous leadership experience with a company called Medible Inc., uh, which offered a digital clinical trials platform heavily utilized across uh, many countries uh, for COVID-19 vaccines. And uh, what I can tell you is that first and foremost, we have to have a little bit of faith um, in technology. We yeah. are in a different world. We were able to run hundreds of clinical trials uh, less than 12 weeks, cutting costs across millions of patients with political latitude because people mm -hmm. were willing to take a risk on technology at a most difficult time. But what we have learned is that that is possible. So with appropriate uh, management and readiness, we should, number one, start to consider those novel ways of applications and thinking about how we can do so at scale. Uh, second is data. Data is quite poor and it's quite siloed across countries. We cannot collaborate and support the needs of a global vaccine without releasing this data and sharing it. And we know industrialists don't often like to do that. So how do we make that happen? And then of course, third, is uh, clarity on policy and regulations. There have been a, no a number of new policies that open gates for uh, different methods and methodologies, protocols uh, to, for, with, for us to innovate together, but these require far greater clarity for us to adopt. So talking about them and ideating them is important and is happening, but the adoption of these new policies has not yet um, happened. And with that, I hope to see greater change. George, yeah. uh, I agree. I agree with everything Hassan said, uh, but uh, we did have the benefit in a, in a very perverse way uh, with an infectious disease that people are scared as hell uh, and huge numbers, and that puts enormous political pressure uh, on politicians and policymakers to respond. We don't have that sense of an emergency yet. So part of it is making the case that this is uh, a, a therapeutic area, a brain health, a brain disease is as great as, if not greater than COVID in terms of its suffering, uh, the impact on women, the impact more generally on society. Uh, we haven't, we've made, we have the data to make that case, but we haven't persuaded politicians yet. So we're now working with Congress, which has been bipartisan support of increases in investment to uh, enlarge the authorities of our global health community inside the United States government uh, to begin to potentially fund global mechanisms in Alzheimer's as they have uh, with respect to uh, to infectious disease. Now, of course, the government par partnered with Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust and large foundations to do that. And that's the strategy that we have to pursue here. But we have to create that sense of emergency, sense of size of problem, uh, and the sense of suffering and impact on peoples more generally, but also uh, particularly on women, because they are two thirds of the cases around the world uh, that uh, can bring forth the political power uh, to actually change politicians' sense of this is as important as an infectious disease and the solutions to it can mirror what we've done with infectious disease uh, and engage primary care uh, facilities around the world to administer a safe uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, accessible uh, mechanism like an active immunotherapy or vaccine. Um, my last really closing question to you, Sans. Um, what would you recommend as the Alzheimer community, um, the women uh, in this community, um, to move forward and to make a preventive measures available as quickly as possible? What would you do? Um, of course, seeing this from a much more global perspective, give us your advice. I think that we have to purposefully act to invest. Funding is the root cause problem, ultimately. And I think the second is um, the rising burning platform, as, as George was trying to articulate. Women live longer. We have an aging population. And we are going to live longer at a much decreased quality of life. And we all should be stating that very clearly. 
and taking active roles in investing in this long-term um, area of brain health, as well as in generational health. There is very little chance, um, given the stagnating and slightly declining rates of global productivity over the next 30 years, that without women and without women's active participation in politics and investment and in telling their stories, that productivity will increase. We are more than half the population, we will guide the genetic code and evolutionary curve. And without our mental health, brain health, and physical health, the future is just not possible. What a statement. Thank you so much. Thank you both um, for this um, quite uh, interesting uh, discussion and leaving us with a lot of thoughts. Um, we know we have to address this globally. We know we have to do that with the best uh, people in the world. We know we need a collaboration between industry, organizations, stakeholders, the financial world. But I think it has started. And um, there are some success stories. When you just look at the uh, collaboration between the DAC, the World Economic Forum, the World Wide Fingers, and this brings me right to our next topic, which is the finger study. And I'm very happy to introduce um, Mia Kivipelto, the uh, visionary architect of the Worldwide Finger Study, who will give us an update where she stands with her uh, study and obviously give us some outlook where potentially this can lead us. And I, as you know, I'm coming from the, today I'm representing the medical field, but I believe strongly that food and nutrition and lifestyle can have a huge impact on the aging population and on uh, cognition and the brain. Mia, I hand Thank over you. to you. Thank you so much, Andrea. It's my great pleasure to be here today. And I'm so happy to give some updates from the Worldwide Fingers, where we are moving towards personalized, multi-domain interventions, global strategies. And of course, we want to use the, this network to study more and focus more on sex and gender differences. We heard clearly how important this is for our future. So I have a few slides just to give a bit more numbers and the scientific background. And George already very nicely presented that we do have so many modifiable risk factors. So there is so much we can do already today. Uh, at least 40% of all dementias are linked to these modifiable risk factors. We have these metabolic vascular risk factors already at midlife. And there are also some more new novel risk factors like hearing loss, social isolation, I would say very important, and even air pollution. And luckily, there are not only risk factors, there are also protective factors like healthy uh, balanced diet, education, lifelong, lifelong learning, I would say, physical, mental, and social activities. And we are studying even more novel risk factors not only depression, but already feelings of loneliness and hopelessness have been linked to an increased risk of dementia, as well as stress and sleep disturbances, which I believe are very common in our societies. Impaired oral health, that could be through inflammation and various infections, which were already mentioned. A lot of this earlier evidence comes from observational studies. And we have also one question which I think we should study more. Are there differences uh, in the prevalence of these risk factors between men and women? And are some risk factors more important for men and women? For me, this, for me, this is really the uh, kind of starting point for the precision medicine so that we can tailor the interventions even better in the future. Well, it has been quite difficult to study, surprisingly difficult to study the, uh, uh, the sex differences because sample size is often quite limited in one study. So what we did in the Nordic countries, we pulled together some epidemiological studies so, so that we had more power to try to have these stratified analyses. And we found indeed that some of the risk factors were more important among women. The genetic risk factor, APOE4, lower education, really highlighting the importance for early educational activities, living alone, hopelessness, and physical inactivity. The same risk factors were important for men as well, but they had a bit more vascular risk factors as well. 
My colleague, Sirin Cindy, who is also joining us today, uh, has been working with me and we have been reviewing the literature, not only these three studies, but also other studies which have been published. And we found that there are indeed some more uh, specific risk factors for women, which are hormonal, for example, early menopause and late initiation of hormone replacement therapy. And there seems to be some risk factors which are maybe a bit more stronger among women, APOE, the genetic risk factor, some vascular risk factors, and even stress and sleep disturbances, as well as weight loss later in life. And of course, as I said, a lot of this evidence comes from observational studies, and we often want to have evidence from clinical trials because this is the highest level of evidence. And finger trial, which I have been leading, was indeed the first randomized uh, clinical trial showing that it is possible to prevent or at least postpone cognitive decline if we put together these modifiable risk factors, the multi-domain intervention. So it's like one hand and five fingers with nutrition, exercise, cognitive training, social activities, and taking care of all vascular and metabolic risk factors. And as you may know, we have been able to show benefits on cognition, but even other benefits, lower risk for stroke and cardiovascular events, 30% lower risk for functional decline, 60% lower risk for chronic diseases, better health-related quality of life, and even health economical benefits. So benefit on brain health, general health, individual and societal level. We did not see any clear differences for cognition between men and women in our first analysis. But now we have been studying even deeper, especially the gene environmental interactions. And I'm very excited about these findings. These are totally new, not yet published, but I wanted to share them with you. Persons and women who had the genetic, genetically increased risk, uh, Alzheimer uh, polygenic risk score beyond ApoE4, they seem to get even more clear benefit of the finger intervention. And for me, this is really good news for women. And I fully agree about the gener generation health approach. Uh, genetic risk factors may not be so non-modifiable, especially for women with healthy lifestyle, you may reduce the risk or at least postpone the onset of, of cognitive decline. This is, of course, something we want to study further, not only in the Nordic countries, but using the whole Worldwide Fingers Network. And here, as you can see from the map, I'm very excited that we are now having 62 countries from all continents who are part of this network. Many trials, 14, are already completed, many of those with positive uh, results, 21 ongoing, and many in the planning phase. And you can start thinking more than 18,000 participants already in the trials. We can really talk about big data, and we support also the data sharing, as was mentioned, so that we can easily, uh, more easily analyze this data. Here you can see the growth of Worldwide Fingers, and I really hope that it continues to grow. And uh, this is a happy photo from our annual meeting when we get together. And I'm also very excited and happy that many of the researchers are actually women. So we are also supporting uh, leadership and uh, academics in, on, on, on that level. And just my final thoughts here, what, which leads us to our discussion part, we are having these international working groups within the worldwide fingers. We have the prospective harmonization for lifestyle, for biomarkers, blood-based biomarkers, even more innovative biomarkers like microbiome. And now we want to launch the international working group focusing on sex and gender differences understanding more about the risk factors, the influence and underlying mechanism between men and women. And my final slide uh, reminds us about the importance of implementation. And even here, we work indeed on different levels. We have lost brain health clinics in connection to memory. 
Schultz mentioned the importance of primary care. That's where we want to implement as well. And the community level, the broadest level as well. And here we have these new initiatives, Family Fingers, where we indeed take the whole family. We want to start even earlier at schools. And here we have the initiative High Five for Life. And then the newest one that is, of course, interlinked Fingers Initiative for Women. And here, I really hope we can use and further develop this uh, finger model together with all of you and start thinking what we can do on awareness level, research level, and implementation level. Thank you so much for your support and looking forward for working together with all of you. Thank you, Mia. As you know, we have a bit the women's uh, PHP so heavily supports this uh, finger for women. Let me just ask one question. Do you believe, I mean, the data becoming more and more clear, I was really, really uh, surprised and happy uh, in a way to see that finally we are starting to understand that there are differences. Uh, they are scientifically proven before we assumed it, but now we have data. Um, so do you think we can actually define lifestyle programs which uh, tailor men and women? So can we make women-specific um, interventional studies, for example, to really uh, respond to the scientific basis? Do you think that's possible? I think it's possible and it's already partly happening because as I showed, of course, the risk factors are there both for men and women, but there may be differences and there are differences during the whole life course. We have not yet fully understood all the differences, hormonal differences, uh, psychosocial differences, and especially what can we do? What is the best way for that? And I would say that the World Wide Fingers for me is a wonderful opportunity to study this because we have women and men in very different cultures and contexts, and the genetic background is different, but also the role for women, for example, can be very, very different. So I hope this can help us indeed during the whole life course. And I was also thinking what was uh, said earlier, Sons said it so nicely that women are having so important role in the family as well. And that's why I also think that this new initiative, Fingers Initiative for Women, is of course very much linked for the Family Fingers Initiative as well. Thank you so much. We need to move on. There's a lot to discuss, but I'm sure we will have um, more opportunities in uh, upcoming dialogues. Um, you spoke about the Worldwide Fingers Network already. You spoke about the 60 countries. Now two of the country representatives are today with us. Uh, joining us is now um, uh, G, um, and joining is also Luz Lucia. Crivelli from Buenos Aires. So please introduce yourself shortly, one minute. G, maybe you start. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Andrea. I mean, this has been so fascinating and I'm really excited for the discussions ahead. So I'm Chi Ude Mama. I'm a translational neuroscience scientist and my research focuses on understanding mechanisms linked to dementia prediction, but also prevention. I'm based across Wake Forest University and Aga Khan University in Kenya and affiliated with MIA's group at Karolinska Institute in Sweden. So my lab adopts translational research approaches to elucidate um, dementia prevention pathways and strategies across diverse populations. But I think very relevant to the topic on hand is that alongside um, leading the Africa Fingers program. Um, I call it several relevant working groups, including the Worldwide Fingers Biomarkers and Biorepositories International Working Group um, that Mia showed just now, but also um, the global CEOI sponsored um, work stream on implementing blood based biomarkers in clinical practice. Um, and importantly, I co I've recently co founded um, the Female Brain and Endocrine Research Consortium, and this was convened to address. Um, um, female specific risk factors for incident and incipient dementia and i'll be sharing a little bit about the work across these different work groups today lucia hello my name is lucia crivelli i'm based in buenos aires argentina i am coordinating the latam fingers initiative this is a finger model um, prevention trial that involves 12 different countries in latin america 
So uh, it has been a very challenging and a very rewarding effort to bring to, together leaders from 12 different countries. We were inspired by the amazing results and the hard work from the original finger and harmonized with that trial. And we are already in the second year of our intervention. Great. Um, maybe Lucia, if you just continue for um, a little bit. So what are the plans right now um, in South America? I mean, I can imagine it's not a simple environment with so many different countries involved. So what are your plans right now? And what are the plans for, let's say, the next uh, three to five years? <clears throat> if you can so keep Latin it Yeah. Keep it short. Latin America is, I will, I will keep it short, <laughs> has the highest percentage of modified, potentially modified risk factors in the world. We have 56% of our cases can be prevented. So we have a lot of room for improvement and that is what, why it was so easy for me to convene leaders from the different countries because we are all worried about brain health in our region and because there are no brain health policies in the countries that are involved in our initiative. So the plan is to develop this trial and to look into other factors that uh, affect brain health and that have been overlooked in the research literature. And when we talk about women, there are two main factors in Latin America that are very strong and are very harmful. One is gender violence. You know that of the 25 countries with the highest rate of femicide, 14 are Latin Americans. So we have a lot of gender violence and this um, uh, like it starts like a chain, a chain of events that lead to depression, social isolation, uh, TBI and other risk factors for dementia. And we also have a very high rate of teenage pregnancy. Teenage pregnancy accounts for, for almost 30 percent of the births in some regions of Latin America. So 30% of the children are born from young mothers. These young mothers don't have the opportunity to finish high school, so they are low educated, then they don't get uh, the opportunity to get a qualified job. So they uh, become part of a poverty cycle in which they don't get appropriate nutrition and they are vulnerable to other risk factors such as obesity and uh, cardiovascular risk factors. and we have a lot of things to do with this, with this uh, spe spe specific two topics in women in Latin America. Um, did you come back to that? Gee, Africa, very poor um, countries, um, different components contributing to um, Alzheimer potentially. What can we learn from your area? What is different in terms of um, different risk factors, but also potentially gender differences? What's specific? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Andrea, that's a very, very important question. And I'm just reflecting on some of the things that um, Lucia talked about now um, in terms of those, those contexts in Latin America, those determinants. And it's quite interesting that we're seeing similar um, being highlighted even in Africa. Um, so in Kenya, where I work, we've, we've developed strategic partnerships with organizations like Worldwide Fingers and DAC. And we've initiated several readiness cohorts in preparation for intervention programs. But really thinking about those specific determinants of cognitive impairment and dementia, I want to just tell you a very, I'm African, so please bear with me, we deal with stories. So I want to tell you a story that um, about something that's just happened um, during a visit last month to one of the very rural communities in Kenya, where we're intending to host dementia um, studies along um, being funded by DAC. So incidentally, there was a tap that was um, provided to this community for safe drinking water. It was installed in that village. However, installation of that tap was detrimental to women because women in that community go to the stream to fetch water. So you've taken off physical exercise, but crucially, the social aspect of this activity had been taken away from them. So had the donors of the tap sought to explore with the women in the first instance whether that tap would be beneficial, a more optimal strategy could have been developed. So maybe purifying water so that people could still have that social aspect to go to the stream and then, um, you know, 
come back and purify it. Because, you know, Mia mentioned about social activity being crucial. What we're finding from our studies in Africa, especially um, in a large scale longitudinal study, we found out beyond um, risk factors such as um, stroke or, uh, or, or other modifiable factors, social engagement um, presented almost four times highest risk for both men and women in terms of developing um, incident dementia. So I think that um, for moving forward, most of our strategies along, around prevention will really have the um, social engagement. So, so it will be based on, uh, on uh, social attributes, but also thinking through um, some more contextual context as well, like um, what Lucia mentioned in terms of um, domestic, we're, we're finding domestic violence to be an important predictor of mm -hmm. cognitive impairment and dementia. We're also finding similar um, things like caregiver boarding. So we'll be leveraging all of these um, unique attributes that we're discovering in our populations for more personalized um, strategies towards prevention. And a short question to both of you before we bring Mia back into the conversation. Um, are there specific aspects um, in your uh, parts of the world which can be transferred back to the origin, if I may say so? So what can we learn from your learnings in your countries? I mean, I would be super interested to see does nutrition play a certain role? I guess overweight, uh, you don't have in the same way as we have it in uh, the developed country. So are there factors we can bring back and um, improve our situation? I don't know if you want me to start, but <laughs> yes, yes, start. I, I spoke to Kelly about this yes, as well <laughs> recently. So no, it's very intriguing because the more we go in, so, so uh, our approach, is really communities based. So we, we co-design everything with our local communities. I like to, as Sans was talking about with addressing inequities um, by funding these community based strategies, because I mean, that's the DNA and the blueprint of our work um, in, in, in these settings. And incidentally, when thinking about caregiver stress, it's not unique to, I'm, I'm, I'm identifying the fact that there are lots of, lots of burdens that have been identified that are similar to what we're seeing even in the developed or Western world. I think that it's safe to say, um, you know, women from early life have this um, burden of care. And, um, and I don't think it's a detrimental burden. I think it's the fact that um, it's not reimbursed, not appreciated, that really provides that the detrimental effect, um, you know, to, to women as a whole. Um, so I do think that um, really leveraging those, so rather than seeing them as unique factors, but thinking through the learnings from how can we ensure um, that girls and women are compensated, um, are appreciated, and, and their, their caregiving to the community is acknowledged. I think that's something we can actually take back to Western societies, um, where also caregiver burden across the lifespan is highest in women. And we're seeing that that's really linked to um, mental and um, poor mental health as well. Lugia, one short question. Sorry, I have to always cut you, but <laughs> no, no what problem. other learnings we could take back from your part of the world? So from my part of the world, one of the most important things to say is that there is little information. So the papers that you can see, the Lancet Commission uh, data is was published recently, but the study is based on, it's, it has more than 10 years. So we need more epidemiology epidemiological studies here, but there was a very interesting study done in Chile that was the, uh, the only one that compared uh, potentially risk factors between men and women. And what they found is a 10% difference between men and women in that region. Women having higher rates of depression, higher rates of physical inactivity, and men having higher rates of uh, alcohol consumption. So there's a lot of things that we can do Today, before our, our intervention, uh, George uh, talked about, and you talked, Andrea, about tailored intervention for women. I think we should do much more research on the topics we mentioned before about domestic violence and about uh, teenage pregnancy and these other factors that may be different across genders in order to start to think about tailored in uh, interventions for women. 
Wonderful. I have a last question on this topic for Mia. Um, I, in, in preparation of this um, uh, dialogue today, I really looked into um, all the data, uh, Mia, which you have generated over the years. It's just an enormous data collection, wonderful data. Um, um, and obviously with now the AI uh, possibilities, all the data management and data science, uh, which we can use. Do you believe we can soon take these data sets, which are invaluable? I mean, they are so valuable for us, uh, even when you think about um, uh, vaccine strategies, and actually tailor um, personalized risk reduction strategies, make it an individual assessment of what is the risk factor um, of a certain individual, and then develop um, a tailor-made um, intervention. Because I mean, our today, the audience, I'm sure every single one will ask this question, well, what about me? How can I do something? How do I know up my risk? What biomarker can I check in order to define my risk and do something about it. So how what are your plans to, to use this incredible data set and how can we come to this sort of individual strategy where I think the field is going? Yeah, this is the direction, more personalized precision medicine or precision prevention, because we need to start early so what we can tailor the interventions, taking into account all the risk factors and profiles. And here using the big data, I'm talking a lot about AI fingers. We can also use the new kind of analytical methods to find new signals. So that's the direction. We also need to keep in mind the whole life course. There may be different risk factors when you are young midlife, earlier in life or later in life. And as you said, it's lifestyle and maybe the pharmacological treatments put together when needed so that the right persons get the right treatment at the right time. And for me, the gender uh, sex differences is the low hanging fruit to start that. And I'm really believing we can do that with joint forces. She and Lucia, wonderful leaders in the regions. We can use the World Wide Fingers data to map the differences. Then we can plan the new interventions, new studies, and finally also increasing awareness because I believe that is very important. Yeah, and I think it's all worth it. Well, I think uh, we could spend hours still on this subject and um, I think um, we will certainly come back so I just would like to thank you today for your time um, but even more so for dedicating your careers your life uh, to such an important um, aspect um, and obviously from a BHP perspective we will do everything to support your very important work and bring it also hopefully to the next dimension before we close today, I would like to bring um, my co-chair, uh, Mara hank Mori here um, to, uh, with a message, message of hope also um, at the year end. Mara. Thank you, Andrea. As already mentioned today, investing in brain health and preventative measures for diseases like Alzheimer's has become not just a choice, but a critical necessity. But Andrea, you shared your scientific vision and commitment today to the development of a vaccine to prevent Alzheimer's globally. You are equally committed to supporting lifestyle changes and improving overall brain health. Your message is what fuels us all at the Global BHP Brain Trust. Across our recent dialogues, we've shared how tackling the challenges of brain health and prevention requires a collective effort. Most importantly, we've emphasized through our speakers that hope does exist within the experience of facing these challenges. In 2023, our family of Brain Trust members has expanded to include distinguished women of vision, passion, and commitment. We welcome these women leaders, Dame Fiona Kendricks, Christian Kuhne, Professor Mia Kivipelto, Constance Egger, Carol Lee Lee, Lily Johnson White, and Corinne Blessy. We also celebrate the success of our standing members and collaborators, recognizing their invaluable contributions to the field, notably the launch and success of the Breathe campaign by Prince Tatiana of Greece and Denmark. Through our partnership with Us Against Alzheimer's, we have engaged in meaningful ways. Their brainstorm podcast hosted by Meryl Comer, a founding member of the Brain Trust, has enriched our engagement. 
as we enter 2024, our ongoing commitment to these partnerships and diverse perspectives continue to shape our understanding and influence of a collective message. Let us carry these lessons and inspiration for this year's dialogue as we continue to navigate the complex landscape of brain health and prevention. We need to work together, advocate for change and foster hope. Andrea, you especially, thank you for instilling and reinforcing this message as a driving force for the Global BHP Brain Trust. We all thank you for your leadership. And it only, the only remaining part is to close this session, which is sad, but um, I, before I do so, I would like to speak about our plans for 2024. We have uh, committed to bringing you innovative dialogues on fascinating topics like the profound impact of the arts on brain and mental health. That is actually the subject of Spring Dialogue in collaboration with the international music star René Fleming, the WHO Global Health Ambassador and the Carian Foundation in Salzburg. Um, the upcoming book of uh, René, Music and Mind, Harnessing the Arts of for Health and Wellness will be part of our next dialogue discussion. And just to say, uh, whether you have been with us from the start or recently joined, your enthusiasm and support is very important for us to make us um, further work hard on enhancing the awareness and contribute to spread the message, there is hope. One way we can do that is uh, by bringing scientific breakthroughs in lifestyle changes, as we have seen today from Mia, nutritional advances, such as the impact of a microbiome, new medicines, such as vaccines, new areas like digital biomarkers, machine learning for early diagnosis of dementia to this audience. We also look for your engagement. Uh, please share with us your thoughts. Um, our chat is open and uh, our Global Brain Trust link page in, can be used for a suggestion. We would be happy uh, to be in dialogue with, with you. Finally, uh, at, uh, as the holiday season approaches, we want to extend warm wishes to each and every one of you. Here is to a season filled with joy, connection, and the shared excitement of what to come. With that, I thank you again and wish you all a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you very much.